Jesse Norman once said, it takes a caring village to raise a child that will be a whole person and a contributing citizen. Good morning. My name is Kellyanne Dixon Hamill, and I'm a statistician and research fellow at the Caribbean Policy Research Institute, Capri, an independent think tank devoted to evidence-based research towards improved policy making in Jamaica and the Caribbean. We conduct research on the four thematic areas, the environment, the economy, governance, and social issues. This public forum straddles two of these areas, social issues and governance, as we're looking at the situation of children in state care. <clears throat> This is one in a series of 10 European Union sponsored projects under the theme, civil society organizations as actors of governance and development. And we are grateful to them for their support for this project and their ongoing support for the work that we do. The rest of the morning will go as follows. We will hear from Capri's Director of Advocacy and lead researcher, Dr. Leanne Levers on Fix the Village, Governance and Accountability for Children in State Care in Jamaica. After which, we will have a panel discussion moderated by Dr. Diana Thorburn, Capri's Director of Research. We welcome our panelists, the Honorable Robert Morgan MP, State Minister in the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, and Professor Julie Meeks Gardner, Professor of Child Development and Nutrition and Director of Graduate Studies and Research at the UWE Open Campus. She's also the former chairman of the Child Development Agency Advisory Board. Before we hear from Dr. Levers, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Frederick Elkfeld, Deputy Head of Mission, European Union, and ask him to bring remarks on behalf of the EU. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. True pleasure to be here uh, together with you today. Um, let me first uh, say that uh, I have profound admiration for Capri, and I'm extremely proud to, to be here today. Can you? Yes, I'm back. Invited again. Okay. Um, the rights of the child are human rights. They're indivisible, universal, and inalienable. I will never be tired enough of repeating this fundamental fact. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development represents the highest aspiration for a bright future for the world's children and is crucial opportunity to realize their rights worldwide. It commits to providing children and youth with a nurturing environment for the full realization of their rights and capabilities. Fulfilling children's rights is a prerequisite for realizing the 2030 agenda. The country has progressed steadily, including adopting a law for, to care for and protect minors, and more recently, the National Plan of Action for Integrated Response to Children and violence. However, as highlighted by UNICEF in the situation analysis of Jamaican children of 2018, significant shortfalls still exist. All stakeholders, especially duty bearers, therefore need to double their efforts and urgently take actions to better protect and safeguard the future of Jamaica's children and their families. The Treaty of the European Union includes an explicit commitment to promote the protection of rights, 
inside in inside European Union. European Union takes this opportunity to reaffirm its commitment to comprehensively protect and promote the rights of the child in its external human rights policy, in line with the provision of the UN Convention in its optional protocols and other relevant international standards and treaties. According to the EU guidelines for the promotion and protection of the rights of the child of 2017, EU cooperation is encouraged to support the strengthening of partner countries' own protection system and further strengthen cooperation with civil societies are in place through a system strengthening approach. In this framework, the EU is ready to work closely with civil society organizations and party countries to understand the main issues that stand in the way of children being able to realize their rights and also to determine the best environment for civil society actors. Therefore, I'm very, very pleased to have been invited to launch of the report Fix the Village, Governance and Accountability for Children in State Care in Jamaica, prepared by Capri, which is a project civil society organizations as actors of governance and development which is co-funded by the European Union. This action aims to enhance governance and accountability by stimulating policy innovation and improving the responsiveness of policies in the specific areas of empowerment of women, children and youth advocacy and economic inclusion. With this support, public debate and promote evidence-based decision-making free from interference and manipulation and preserving open democratic. I would like to conclude by congratulating Capri and the researcher Mrs. Ian Levers for this new valuable contribution to the public debate. The presence of Honorable Robert Morgan, State Minister in the Minister of Education, News and Information with us today as a panelist is the best assurance of the commitment of the government of Jamaica to work to contribute to the best interest of children. In this same spirit, I look forward to hearing to the findings and the discussion that will follow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Eckfeldt. We are going to be using Slido today those of you who have attended our events before will be familiar with Slido. Those of you who aren't, go to your browser and log, go to slido.com. Once you're on the Slido page, enter Capri as the event code. This will take you to a page where you can post questions and vote up questions. There are also some polls on Slido and we would like you to go now to do the first poll and there'll be two other polls that follow. It's now, my job to introduce Dr. Leanne Levers, who is going to make the main presentation of this morning's event, Fix the Children. There are nearly 5,000 children in state care that are under the protection of the Child Protection and Family Services Agency. 60% of these children are sent to state care because they're considered uncontrollable, which due to the vague and undefined use of the term in the legislation can be defined as almost anything, ranging from having a disability or being perceived as sexually promiscuous or simply being one of the 5,000 unwanted children that are born each year, in part due to the illegality of abortion in Jamaica. This report looks at the role that governance and accountability play in the quality of care for this particularly vulnerable group of children based on an ideal approach to state care that is set out by human rights standards. 
Now, research shows that state care should be a short-term, temporary replacement for the family unit. According to much of the research, long periods of time in state care, regardless of the quality, result in poorer outcomes for children. So, for instance, the Boys Town Initiative, which has over 10 locations across the United States, found that their high school dropout rates were as high as 75%. Their use of hard drugs was 50% higher than the average population, and up to 80% are likely to have mental health or behavioral problems. Unfortunately, we do not have the available data on this for Jamaica, as the last comprehensive prison study that was done did not ascertain how many prisoners were former wards of the state. However, we do have over 20 reports that have highlighted that in Jamaica, children in need of care and protection experience instances of abuse and substandard living conditions, including a lack of educational, medical, and psychological resources. So over the last 10 years, Jamaicans for Justice noted that there were more than 1,600 critical incidents taking place in childcare. Between 2006 and 2010, there were 500 reported cases of abuse, many of which were perpetrated by staff. In 2017, the average age of intercourse for children in state care was 11 years old. And of a sample of 60 girls who were in state care that were tested, approximately one third tested positive for STDs. We also see that in care, children about 60% of children exhibit psychosocial problems and 76% exhibit maladjusted behaviors ranging from social withdrawal, aggression, and suicidal tendencies. And there have also been reports that children are being denied access to education as punishment for poor behavior. Now, one of the main contributions to a successful state care system is that of governance. Governance encompasses the structures and processes that are designed to ensure efficient running of any program or institution. So it's essentially how something is ruled or governed. Human rights, through various instruments, such as the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the UN Guidelines on Alternative Care, outline an effective universal framework to provide best practice principles that all countries can adapt to their own context. This framework identifies a set of characteristics for good governance, including it being participatory, consensus-oriented, accountable and transparent, responsive, effective and efficient, equitable and inclusive, as well as respecting the rule of law. In using this human rights framework as an ideal to compare to the Jamaican state care system, our report identified four areas of concern. Administrative capacity, monitoring and evaluation, use of evidence-based policy and practice, collaboration and strategic involvement of all stakeholders, particularly children. When we look at administrative weaknesses, we see that the governance structure is disjointed. So many of the agencies that are involved in child care and protection sit across multiple ministries. For instance, Sissoko, which is responsible for the investigation of sexual offenses against children, sits under the Ministry of National Security, while the CPFSA sits under the Ministry of Education. Now, despite sitting under the Ministry of Education, the CPFSA is directly financed by the Ministry of Finance, which means that its governing ministry, Ministry of Education, has little control over its budget. There are also no regular multi-agency meetings that might allow for sharing and collaboration. We also recognize a number of legislative issues. So the CPFSA is not actually named within the CCPA, the Child Care and Protection Act, as the agency responsible for care and protection of children in Jamaica. There is also no legislative authority for the Adoption Board. And as a result, many of the functions that are given by the Adoption Act are carried out by the CPFSA themselves. We also noted a lack of database management. So HEMO, the software system that is used by the Child Development Agency, has not been extended to other agencies. So for instance, the National Children's Registry is still using Microsoft Word to log its cases. We note a lack of resources. 
In 2020, four psychologists were servicing more than 4,000 children in care. And in and according to social workers, 100 social workers that were surveyed had a caseload of 150, which is overwhelming in comparison to the international standard, which is 10 to 30 cases per social worker. Also, foster care parents receive a woefully inadequate sum of $16,000 every two months. We also see that there is an issue around monitoring and evaluation. So currently, there is no independent oversight that holds the CPFSA and relevant agencies accountable. Now, the Convention of the Rights of the Child does offer two accountability pathways. The first is the submission of regular reports to the committee. However, the last report was submitted in 2015. Unfortunately, it was actually due in 2008. The optional protocol is the second accountability pathway. The CRC permits monitoring visits without invitation from the states. However, Jamaica has not yet ratified this optional protocol. There is also an advisory board that offers recommendations and support to both the minister and the CPFSA. However, there is no legal obligation for the portfolio minister or the CPFSA to take advice of the advisory board. And we've noted a history of consistent and lim inconsistent and limited monitoring of children's home and foster placements. So for instance, in 2011, monitoring officers only made 63% of their visits to eight facilities. And while there was an increase of, in visits in 2013, no visits were recorded to any homes in the second half of 2014. In 2009, we saw that 16% of foster care parents reported that there was little to no monitoring visits by CDA officers, and 53% of children said that they had little to no interaction with CDA officers when they did visit. We also see that there is a lack of evidence-based policy. It's practice in Jamaica that children who may be eligible for adoption should not be placed in foster care. That is, quite counterintuitively, children in foster care are, by the agency's definition, not eligible for adoption. There is also no data collected on adoption or foster care in Jamaica for these practices to be considered evidence-based. We have no structure, structured follow-up on the children who transition out of care annually as a result of them turning 18, and so there is really no way for us to measure the overall effectiveness of institutional care specifically. Finally, we see that there's also a limited level of collaboration. I've already noted the limited sharing of information across agencies. However, there's a failure to incorporate the voice of the youth. For instance, the Children's Advisory Panel, there's no indication that the Children's Advisory Panel has any input in policymaking. Rather, their role seems to be limited to that of PR and symbolic gestures. And despite the protocols indicating that the CEO should be present at the meetings, evidence showed that there's no consistent communication between the children's advisory panel and the CEO. And the person who actually sits in on the children's advisory panel meetings is the PR representative. There is also a failure to partner with civil society organizations to reconcile the limited resources that we've mentioned earlier. There is limited representation of civil society on strategic bodies, and also research showed that the private homes in particular are forced to depend on volunteers and international organizations for support. Now, while this is useful, it does mean that the quality and frequency of care that children receive is inconsistent. We also found limited multi-agency working. Now, there was an attempt to engender more collaboration across state agencies through the Multi-Agency Strategic Development Plan for Child Protection to carry out more efficient investigations of abuse. However, this program has had no evaluation and due to a lack of resources has been limited to Kingston. As a result of this research, we found that there are a number of consequences due to this poor governance and accountability system. The first is the mistreatment and neglect of children in care. So there's poor documentation of children, which means that children can get lost in the system. So for instance, in 2013, 148 children had to be removed from adult remand centers. And in 2018, there was a fire at Walker's place of safety where two children died. 
and reports indicate that these were due to issues in terms of monitoring and adherence to protocols. Also, of the 142 checks, monitoring checks from 20 facilities, none of them mentioned educational programs. And 30% of children, particularly foster, pair, foster placements, admitted to having problems at school. And ultimately, what this means is a limited success in transitioning children into family-based care, which is the stated intention of the CPFSA. So in October 2020, there were over 138 approved adopters waiting for a child to be placed with them, the longest one having been approved in 2011. Approximately 290 children transition out of care because they turn 18 with little to no support. And in particular, we found that children who are disabled and have special needs are unlikely to ever leave state care as they are not supplied with the resources to become independent contributing members of society. As a result, we offer a number of recommendations. The first is legislative reform. So the Child Care and Protection Act should be reviewed immediately. And these reviews should both take into account evidence-based research as well as the voices of the children. We also note that the CRC optional protocol should be ratified and the UN guidelines on alternative care should be incorporated into our national legislation. In terms of database management and implementation, the Sohima software we mentioned should be extended to all relevant agencies to improve sharing of information and efficient investigations of abuse. Also, consistent data collection and analysis should be done, as well as digitization of all case files. And the use of this data should be engaged in longitud longitudinal research of each element of state care, ranging from institutional care to fostering to adoption. We also would like to see increased representation and accountability. The Advisory Council, which should provide advice to both the CPFSA and the Minister, as well as the Board of Visitors, should be convened immediately as a means of independent oversight. And the Children's Advisory Panel, where membership is currently dependent on educational performance, should have their terms of reference changed to represent the needs of and views of those who are most at risk in state care, such as teenage mothers and the disabled. We know that it takes a village to raise a child. However, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down just to feel its warmth. It is apparent from the research that the lack of support for children in care has poorer outcomes for children and ultimately our society. Our failure to protect our, and care for our most vulnerable continues to be at our own peril. Thank you, Leanne, for the presentation. Ahead of our moving into the panel discussion, uh, please log into Slido and start putting your questions there and take the poll if you haven't done so already. Here, I'm going to invite each of our panelists to give a two minute response to the presentation and to the report itself, which was condensed in this presentation. I'm going to ask Minister, Honourable Minister Robert Nesta Morgan to start by giving his two-minute response to the presentation and the report. Hi, good, good day, Dr. Thorburn, and good day to your panelists. And thank you, Leon, Dr. Livers, for your presentation. I am not going to do what would typically be done, which is to challenge anything in the report because at the end of the day, I think all of us can recognize that there are challenges within the system. What I'm going to do is speak about what we have done since, at least I've been here um, since September. So the report makes several recommendations, particularly amend the Adoption Act and the CCPA. A draft cabinet submission is ready for submission to cabinet regarding the amendments to the CCPA. You would recall that in 2013, Senator Kamina Johnson-Smith tabled a private member's motion in the Senate 
calling for amendments to several pieces of legislation related to women and children and involved in out of that a joint select committee was convened and it took a couple of years also the unicef and cpfsa were having a process of reviewing the ccpa as well and both those processes came together and what it has resulted in is a cabinet submission that I have in my possession. Also, the amendments of the Adoption Act, that is something that's the top priority for us. It is something that we're working on and we can report on that soon. The, the recommendations also spoke about the advisory board. So I can confirm that the those boards are before cabinet, um, most of the boards, including the advisory board that was not appointed since 2007. That one is being appointed. I can say that it will be chaired by Ivan Cruikshank and comprised of several stakeholders. What I've tried to do is to try to call on a wide cross section of expertise within the childcare sector, including members of civil society to participate in these boards and to be able to give us um, different perspectives as it relates to how the system is and what reforms need to be done. The reality is that we are in the process of reform because we recognize that we have significant challenges within the childcare ecosystem. I just completed a meeting this morning with UNICEF, the Youth Division and this, the CPFSA and one of the discussions that we're having is moving forward with a lot of these changes that we're making. For example, the licensing of children's homes. Um, in January, several homes we recognized did not fit the criteria to receive a license. And we had to put them on a path of reform where in order for them to be licensed, they had to fulfill the requirements such as their fire safety, such as the health requirements, such as um, how are they taking care of the children in terms of educational needs and psychosocial needs. The reason why we did that was that we recognized that we needed to enforce more accountability within the system. Do remember that the majority of our homes are private homes. Only nine of them are government run. And the CPFSA oversees a licensing regime for the private homes. So we have a responsibility to ensure that these homes are accountable. The other thing that we're doing is we're also creating a pathway for success for each child who enters the childcare ecosystem. So what we, as a instruction to the CPFSA is that the minute a child interacts with the state, there should be an assessment of that child in all aspects of that child from a psychological perspective, a social perspective, an academic perspective to create a file on that child so we know exactly where to place that child within the system. But then in placing that child within the system, you have to know where, where in the system has the best ability for that child to be placed. And currently, one of the challenges that we've had is that many of the homes are not geared towards specific things. They are basically all things to all men. So we have to reform the system to ensure. So for example, one of the things we want to do is to turn Maxfield Park into a center of excellence for childcare in Jamaica which is kind of a children's village that has all of the necessary support. I think I run out of time, right? Yes, you have, Minister. Let me stop. But I'm sure you'll have an opportunity in the question and answer discussion that is about to follow. Professor Meeks, can you give your two minute response, please? Uh, Professor Meeks, I think you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Hello, are you hearing me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Oh, I, I'm so sorry about that. Um, thank you very much. And thank you to the minister for his updates on what has been happening since the report. Uh, I wanted to just say about the report itself. I thought it was really well done. And I particularly liked the framework of human rights and child rights that was used to assess the situation. And I also appreciated that some examples from other low-resource countries 
were used so that we weren't benchmarking or comparing with some very high resourced countries. There are many issues here, as is clear from, from what you've heard. And I do appreciate that there are uh, cabinet papers coming forward and so on. Uh, but Minister, what has happened though is since you tell us this, we are unable to re respond in terms of what we think is, is coming because we, it's not before us as yet. One of the things I would like to say though is the information about that you mentioned should be collected, which is background data on all the children once they interact with the system. That has always been a requirement. So now that you're saying that that needs to be a requirement, what is going to be different? It, it was always meant to be. Um, in terms of the recommendations, many, most even of the recommendations are not resource requirements. They are shifts in governance and adjustments. Things like uh, signing on to the optional protocol. So it is not that we can say, oh, we can't do these recommendations because we are so strained for cash. There are many things that can be done. And I would really like to hear whether they will be taken seriously enough to be done. The matter of children being lost in a system, children dying in fires and children being sexually abused and facing other kinds of abuse, it can't wait. It can't wait until things are tidier. There needs to be urgent action. Back to you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Meeks. And we have questions pouring in. And I really like this question because I think that this is something that the public and those of us who are not directly involved in the sector often have this challenge with. We, we know that things are not going well. What can the average person do to support the initiatives and reform that the minister mentioned? And what can the general public do to try and push, advocate, uh, assist in whatever way to support the changes that the report recommends and to see follow through on what the minister has said? Because as Professor Meeks has, so has reminded us, a lot of these recommendations have been made before, a lot of these needs have been recognized before and we're still in the in the same position. I'm gonna ask actually each of the panelists to, to answer that from their perspective. What can the public and the an individual private person do to support change? Diane? You know, uh, recently that Minister Morgan has implemented a few programs that persons can become involved in, uh, including from, I, I, forgive me if I get you wrong, from Cradle to Loving Arms. Um, that seems to be an initiative, I think, applying to become a foster parent. I know that there are Christmas in initiatives during Christmas time where children can be taken home so they can be, you know, celebrate Christmas with families and really engaging from a volunteer perspective to start providing support, whether you're a doctor or a, a lawyer or just a stay at home mom, uh, not just a stay at home mom, but a stay at home mom to provide support to the children that are in care. Um, you know, through whatever resources that you have. And I'm certain that donations, whether financial or in kind, are always welcomed. So I think that would be my uh, initial response to that statement, to that question. Uh, Minister, what would you say the general public or a private citizen could do to support the change and the reform? So there are two answers to that question. One question is the answer that Leon gave. But then there's a bigger question that we have to contend with as a society, and it's how we treat our children. The reason why we have so many children in state care is because the society and our communities and our families have caused them to be in state care. Incidents of abuse, incidents of rape, incidents of neglect, parents who are not able to control their children cause them to be in front of the courts, which then, based on the CCPA, which we are now repealing Section 24, that, doc, that submission has been submit, is being submitted to Cabinet. So there are two sides to it. So we need more resources for child care. We need to reform the child care system. 
which was not purpose built to fit into the requirements of our society. We have so many private homes, which in many cases are underfunded and do not have the resources. Plus we have another section where we have um, juvenile facilities within the CCPA, as well as homes within the CCPA. My vision for it is that we have too many homes. We need to de-institutionalize because the best place for a child is with their biological parent. If that is not working out, the best place for them is with a relative. If that is not working out, the best place for them is with a family. And so the, so the institutionalization should be the last resort. Because the reason why I pushed so hard on the zero to three is that I recognized that there were babies in cribs at children's homes in dark rooms not being stimulated. I visited a children's home because I usually visit them unannounced on occasion. And I went into the crib, the, the nursery section, and I was walking past the curtain. I saw a dark room and I looked to my right and I saw two little beady eyes in the dark, a child just in the crib. And I said to Miss Gage Gray, this is exactly why we need the zero to three policy. So the zero to three policy is a part of the deinstitutionalization where no child under three should ever have to spend any time in a, in a child care facility. We have already started engaging with prospective adopters. We have over a hundred of them to say to them, will you be willing to foster a child? Not saying that you're going to be able to adopt that child, but we still have to go through the legal processes. But will you be able to foster a child to assist the country in not institutionalizing zero to three years old? It also requires the government to spend a lot more money in supporting of the foster system. We have already started the process of trying to educate society more about foster care. So yes, we do need resources. We do need corporate Jamaica. We do need Jamaicans in general to assist. But what we need more than anything else is for us as a society to change how we see children and how we treat children because that is the big reason why we have so many children in state care having to be in children's homes or facilities or so on so it's a two-pronged thing you can help by helping to stop the abuse of our children we can also help by becoming a foster parent if you're qualified becoming an adopter if you're an adopter if you're qualified and so on uh, before I go to you, Julie, I just wanted to uh, point out something that came up yeah. in some other research that we're doing on violence, uh, domestic and uh, violence in the period of COVID. And one of the things that we found is that parents are actually beating their children less. And while we don't know exactly why, we can speculate that it is the pressure of speaking out against it when children being beaten, the videos go viral to condemnation. So I think that the idea that each of us can play a part, even if it is by espousing better treatment of our children um, and supporting parents who are frustrated or guardians who are frustrated, that they don't take out their frustrations on children. That, as, as vague as that may sound, it seems to be that that could be having an effect so in a way, uh, peer pressure, for want of a, of a better word, as, as one small thing that every single person can do, just do not tolerate uh, abusing children in any way. Uh, Professor Meeks, your take on how the public or a private citizen can support change and reform? Thank you. And uh, I really am appreciated what the minister has said. And it's very encouraging to hear that a zero to three policy whereby children of that age group are not going to be in institutions, in homes, that would be a very, very good news. Um, the other recommendations such as fostering a child if you can, providing some care if you can in whatever way um, are also you know, strongly supported. And I would like to add to those that there is a lot of stigma uh, that children in care face. And the children in care are stigmatized because for some reason, society has them earmarked as troublemakers, problematic, or some other problem. They face stigma at school from both students and teachers. They face stigma when they try to obtain training outside of school, and they face desperate stigma when they're trying to get jobs 
they say once you see um, on our resume that we spend some time in a home, the whole tone of an interview changes. These children are in care for their welfare, not as some kind of punishment because they are problem children. And so my addition to what else could be done is to take a look at what stigma uh, is there is and how you can play a role personally and in sharing about stigma to reduce it for our children in care. Thank you. Thank you. And what you've just said, uh, Professor Meeks, is taking us into another set of questions, actually, quite a few questions that are asking about children and youth who are transitioning out of state care, uh, what's being done to support them, how are they being monitored, uh, what are their prospects? And I think, Professor Meeks, you were involved in an initiative in this regard. So I'd ask you to respond first to that and then ask Minister Morgan for what else he has on his agenda for children transitioning out of care. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I was uh, a principal investigator of a large project, the Transitioning Living Program for Children in State Care, which ran from 2014 to 2020. This project was aimed at supporting the transitional programming that was already in place within CPFSA for children leaving state care and going out into the wild world. Um, bearing in mind that at age 18, most people don't throw out their children out of their home and say, you're on your own. Uh, and we, we felt that there needed to be much stronger support at that stage for youth leaving care. Um, the program itself, we did, uh, it, it was very, very wide ranging. The largest inputs were homes, apartment complexes, not homes, apartment complexes, not to be run like a home, but to be run like uh, any apartment. You pay a small rent, you follow the rules of the apartment complex and you're much more independent, but there is an oversight still. Um, and the oversight will still be with CP FSA. There are a number of other programs where we try to support skills training. We try to support uh, training of caregivers within the system so that they had, uh, we were more able to provide training in life skills. And, and this part is ongoing now looking at um, trauma-informed care for those children. We also help them to um, get into that exam, to get scholarships to take exams and to help them with entrepreneurship. There were entrepreneurship development programs and as well there were uh, buses that were provided. So there was a whole range of support provided for CPFSA and for the youth leaving state care at that time to build on what there was before. That was the, the program. Okay, thank you. Uh, Minister Morgan, uh, your comments on children who are leaving state care and transitioning out? It's the presentation by Professor Meeks because that effort continues. Um, it's in, interesting to note that one of the first functions I have done as state minister was a ceremony to honor children in state care who have matriculated, whether through CSEC or to university. So last year, we spent a record amount of money on um, tertiary support for students in state care. And also last year, we had a record number of passes between like grade one and two for children in state care. So the government commits that we will pay all fees related to exams and so on, and also all fees related to tertiary, tertiary matriculation for children in state care. We also have a transitional living facilities. There's a, there are some in the West, there are some in Kingston, where children who are no longer in the traditional um, child care facility who have matriculated or who are transitioning, whether they're going to Hart, whether they're going to the University of the West Indies or UTEC or any tertiary institution can stay at these facilities while they get the support 
some of them some of them also live on residential halls on campus or the cpfsa will pay rent for some of them who live outside of these transitional facilities it's a it's a a commitment that the government through the cpfsa has made that we want every child who comes through the child care facility who matriculates to have the best opportunity to success but we're extending that further um, i mentioned earlier in my statement about um, an assessment at the beginning and professor meeks mentioned that yes that has already been there but what i was speaking about is a deeper assessment so in order to create a pathway for success for a child it's not just about a psychosocial assessment it's also about looking at every single aspect of that child in order to place that child on a particular pathway for success and that is the new approach that we're taking here so for example a child who comes from an abused situation what are the specific things that needs to happen over time to help that child to readjust in the system so ultimately that child can matriculate whether to go to university in another 10 years or five years to be able to be a proper functioning member of society it is my philosophy that the government is the most powerful entity within the society hence children who are in the custody of the government for care and protection should have the best opportunities a big part of the reason for the stigma associated with children in state care is the perception within people in the society that they are less than or that they are deviants or that they are bad pitney if the public can be educated based on the things that we're doing and the things that we are changing within the system to say that children who come into state care get the best care or children who are associated with the, with the government child care ecosystem will get the best opportunity to be the best they can be then people will actually want to be associated with children who have interacted with the state because those children will be the most equipped and capable to contribute positively to society and that is the philosophical approach to our thing so all of the things that we're doing the zero to three the um the reduction of children who have to be in the child care facilities the removal of section 24 the reform of the ccpa the acquiescing to these protocols on the un the creation of children's villages that are full service rehabilitation centers all of these is to create an environment where once a child enters in the child care ecosystem they have the best opportunity to be the best person they can be okay thank you just to mention that that the transitional living program that professor meeks uh, just talked about which is a very extensive and expensive program was supported by usaid over the years of its uh, implementation we have several more questions and we're running out of time. So I'm gonna just take one more uh, question, which I'm trying to amalgamate uh, several questions into one, which is issue of permanency planning, adoption, foster care. Why does it take an initiative, a brand new initiative to accelerate placement of children when knowing that children young especially babies in institutions doesn't have good outcomes for anybody why is it only now that this is being addressed and what exactly is being done to change this uh minister so you would appreciate that i'm a bit restrained in speaking of things that were before my time because i was not there what i can speak about is what we have seen and what we're trying to evolve so there was a time when it was felt that a children's home was a good place for a child you need to put them in a regime of discipline and enforcement and they should wake up at six and they should go in a line and they should do this we have had the benefit of science and study over many years um, and we have had to evolve that philosophy we are we are now recognizing more and more that a children's home is not a it's not the best place for a child because children need particular stimulation especially at the early age so remember that the ccpa was was like 2007 i think 
um, so 2004 and then updated 2004 in 2007. But the but because the 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 the, 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 the study of children has continued to evolve and over time we begin to learn more and more about children and what is best for children. And do remember, let us not forget, we are a developing country. We do not necessarily all the time have all the resources to look at all the things and evolve the things as quickly as possible. But as the, as the knowledge becomes more widespread and as it becomes more accepted, we have to start looking at our systems and say, hold on, but this is a problem, it needs to change. So the reason why the zero to three is happening now is because a lot of persons over many years have been looking at the system, have been advocating for change and have been contributing to the discussion to reform the system. And it is from their knowledge and their experience that a minister like myself can benefit from an enhanced thinking to push forward a a, a, a new agenda which has significant support because I would not be able to do it if I did not have the support of a significant amount of stakeholders within the society. Because remember, we are dealing with reforming institutions and institutionalized approaches which requires significant effort and significant strength from persons external to institutions to force them to reform. So the CPFSA would have adopted protocols over a decade of how to approach particular things. And a new person comes now and says, I want to change those protocols. The CPFSA is going to say to me, but this has been working. This is what we've been doing for 10 years. And then I come now and I say, but we have a study here from Capri which says that this is wrong. We need to fix it. But I cannot fix it without the support. And I think we're at that point in our society now where there's a critical mass that has developed to reform of the childcare system. And you see it with the whole situation with the young lady who was murdered. Immediately, it created a groundswell of support within the society about particular issues. It has happened before, but every time it happens, it becomes more focused, it becomes stronger, it becomes more pointed. That is forcing politicians, technocrats, to look at what the people are saying analyze the data, analyze the academic writing and make the change. So it's not a case where you are going to say it has already been there. It has not already been there because the challenges have been institutionalized. But because we have more information and we have the benefit of a critical mass of people who are willing to support the change, we can now start implementing it. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to use our wrap-up sequence, which is to give each panelist a minute for any last thoughts, by asking you to focus your thoughts on pretty much one of the questions that has been coming up, which is the issue of enforcement. Plans in the pipeline, how do we not only advocate, but be confident and, and trust that now we may see some change after so long change has come. I'll ask you, Leanne, to just give your one minute sum up if, and if you can just keep that thought in mind as you do. Sure, well, I think speaking from the reports, there is definitely obvious around monitoring and evaluation. And I think many of the recommendations, particularly around the optional protocol and around addressing the lack of resources is a beginning step to uh, you know, creating a better outcome for children that are in state care, as well as some of the other things that Minister Morgan mentioned around, around prevention of children entering into state care to begin with. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's it's really promising and, you know, it, it's endearing and heartwarming to know that the minister and uh, the ministry is in support of many of the things that we've said or many of the things that have borne out of the report and i look forward to hopefully collaborating and working collectively to make sure that many of these changes actually uh you know get to the point of implementation and so we can see and and document accordingly the improvements that are made as as we go along okay thank you uh professor meeks your last thoughts um uh, yes i wanted to talk about the people in the system. I believe that just about everyone, maybe 99 plus percent, have very, very good intentions. Their heart is in the right place. But I think that within the system, that's the childcare system, 
Um, I think that there is a need for improved delivery. So I'm not saying that people are being heartless or don't care or that they're not working hard. I just think that there needs to be greater emphasis on uh, monitoring output and outcomes. And I think part of the um, part of the informed trauma informed care training should help because many persons who are working with the children are also themselves traumatized and need to bear that in mind as they go forward. That's my one minute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister Morgan, I'm giving you the last minute, but just also recognizing how transparent you have been in this discussion and in responding to a report which has a lot of uncomfortable and difficult things in it. If you could just give your last minute uh, response as we wrap up. So it would have been disingenuous of me to come and pretend that our child care system generally um, is what we want it to be. From the minute we stepped into this ministry, myself and the minister have recognized that there are significant challenges in how Jamaica treats its children, not just from a government perspective, but also as a society. We are still using corporal punishment as a means of discipline, which means that children are being taught that violence is the best approach to, to solve their conflict. And you can see the extrapolation of the consequences of that on the news at night. But the society seems in many cases sometimes not ready to make the change or to evolve from those places. But the good thing about where we are now is that there is a significant focus on what Jamaica should do for its children and how Jamaica needs to reform how it treats its children. From my perspective, I have spent the time over the last six months focusing on a few areas. The reform of the Child Care and Protection Act, the removal of Section 24 of the Act that gives the judge the discretion to designate, give a child a detention order deeming them quote unquote uncontrollable. The reform of the Adoption Act, the zero to three policy, the creating of a grading system for children's zones, which puts them on a path for reform, the enforcement of license requirements for children's homes, looking at the deinstitutionalization of children, focusing on the policy as it relates to children's policy, which has not been reformed since the 90s, looking at what other frameworks we can put in place, including bilateral and multilateral agreements, including UN conventions that we need to acquiesce to. But at the same time we're doing this at the ministry and doing hard work and collaborating with stakeholders, there's a bigger issue that we need to contend with, and that is how the country sees children. Do we see them as ornaments, fathers, and then pension plans? Or do we see them as persons who can evolve to contribute significantly to the society? Five seconds. I've been very concerned about children at stoplights. So I went to the CPFC and I said, why we can't take the children off the street? She said, Minister, well, we take them off the street, but the parents send them back out. And a lot of people don't recognize that a lot of the children who are at stoplights are not homeless. They're actually working. And when you remove them, which is why we have to change the framework, we have to change the CCPA to deal with the issue of parental rights, a difficult conversation that we're, we need to have as a society. Should the courts be able to remove parental rights of parents who continue to put their children at stoplights to, 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 to whatever? So those are some of the big issues that we need to, to discuss. It has to be a national approach. It cannot just be the ministry or Capri or whatever. And that is what I'm asking, that people join with us to try and enhance the change. We're always willing to listen. We're always willing to collaborate because at the end of the day, our children are our future. Thank you, Minister Morgan. And before I hand over to Kelly, I would ask our audience to just go back on Slido one more time and take our final poll. Over to you, Kelly. Presentation and discussion. We now have an idea of how we as citizens need to improve our system to help some of the most vulnerable children among us. We thank Dr. Leva's lead researcher for her hard work and presentation. Thank you also to Minister Morgan and Professor Meeks Gardner for participating in our panel and for Dr. Thorburn for moderating. 
We also thank you who joined us today and for those who participated in the question and answer session. We are grateful to the European Union and the other good corporate citizens who support Capri's work in the public interest throughout the year. To view the full report related today, to today's forum, please visit our website, capricaribbean.org. And also, look out for our next event on Thursday, April 15, when we will host a public forum to launch our next report, The Impact of COVID-19 on Vulnerable Communities in the Caribbean. Please follow our social media platforms for additional information. Have a wonderful afternoon.